Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. These guys, pending on my voice, is pending on how they react. Antecedent behavior consequence. Okay, so I'm using. Um, I'm rearranging my environment to get success for the outcome I want. And that is the tone of my voice. At least, I think. We'll see. So, I've got my enrichment lined up, ready to go. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. My name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center teaching people all over the world how to empower animals and the people that care for them. And we do that through our live streaming services um, where you can find out more um, on our website, the T H E Animal Behavior Center.com. You can always email me as well, which you can email me at Laura, L A R A, at the Animal Behavior Center.com. <clears throat> and I answer each and every one of my emails. Um, sometimes it may take me a while, but I get to them because I'm also answering all my messages and messenger, all my texts and my phone calls, which I never answer. Um, so anyways, we got a busy day. We got, I've got a lot to share with you here on, um, coffee with Chris. And then once I'm done, I've got a lot to do today. So right at 10 o'clock, I've got an enrichment volunteer showing up. I have a cage being delivered. I have to medicate a toucan, and oh, I'm moving a couple of hornbills, and I've got to get some baboons outside. So that's all at 10 o'clock. Um, so I've got my list of things to do. For those that um, may be new to Coffee with the Critters, this is a live stream I put on every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, where we have guests, um, different topics, uh, in the area of applied animal behavior. This is what that means in a nutshell is the science of behavior um, of working with animals. And um, I specialize in using applied behavior analysis with animals. Um, and what that means is um, I get animals to do what I need them to do without the use of force and for several different reasons. I want to empower animals. I want per animals to thrive under my care, okay? Um, and I am responsible for the lives uh, mentally and physically of a lot of different animals. And my passion of working with animals is what has me sitting right here today talking to you. Um, so good morning, Brianna, down there in uh, Georgia from Papiago House. Rescue. We've got uh, Adrian Mock on here. Our manager, Karen Pratt. Melinda. Good morning, Melinda. Faithful follower and Jill, another faithful follower, and Sylvia and Mark and Ray and Katie and Bobby, faithful followers. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. So, um, got a lot to talk about today. And as you may or may most of you are on here do know, um, before I talk about my topic each week, um, I go through a couple of different things. And one is a recap of what has happened from the week before. For those that are new, our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. I just had somebody visit this website the other day. Um, one that has referred somebody, a specialist at Harvard, to get in touch with us. Um, to possibly do a podcast in a particular area um, that focuses on applied behavior analysis. So they said they visited my website and it was very appealing. And I said, thank you. It cost me a lot of money to make that website again. Um, so um, we do have several different events coming up. They're all virtual as of right now, but we are planning some for 2021 that are in person. Okay, um, so you can find out more about that on our website or right here on our Facebook page. Check out our events section. Hey, Patty, I'm live, but that's okay. 
Um, also, you can sign up for our email newsletter. Um, you will see that right here on our Facebook page. Click right here on join our email newsletter. I love to write and I miss writing. You guys know there's only three different periodicals that I write for. Um, and I haven't been able to write lately because I've been too busy, but things are getting organized. I have taken on, on quite a bit in reorganizing a lot of things. Um, and um, I'm chomping at the bit to get back to my writing because I like to sit down with a glass of wine. Okay. Hell, just give me the whole bottle. And um, I'll just keep writing. I love to write. I'm very passionate about writing. So um, our email newsletters, you'll see those starting to go out in the mail. And when you see this right here, you know you have an email from me. That is our newsletter. Um, lastly, before we get started in showing um, a recap of some cool things that have happened this past week, for those of you that are interested um, in our services, we have... Um, our online memberships, level one and level two. Level one is more for companion animals. Level two is more for people more intent in the field, wanting to understand in-depth weekly information, uh, live streams, Q&As, group discussions, interviews with professionals. Um, that is level two. Um, so they are live streaming services of uh, the work that I do here. Some people also just want species specific so that's where we have our projects such as the parrot project and the pig project okay so um i am responsible for a lot and when i see i i things like this you know, these are okay short-term behaviors but i want to see animals engaged thriving interacting um, and that is through enrichment. All right. Um, and in the field of work that I do, um, enrichment is essential. Every animal, every animal's lives and every animal enclosure should be filled, quote unquote, filled with enrichment and enrichment keeps the animals mentally and physically engaged. A lot of times when people see animals, um, like studies show that um, one of the worst things you can do is see an animal in an enclosure with nothing to do, okay? Uh, a lot of times I also say the more intelligent the animal, the harder it is to keep. <laughs> uh, we had an enrichment specialist uh, visit yesterday that said they were very impressed with the amount of enrichment supplied to these two. And enrichment comes in many forms, and that can be through training. That's why I do what I do, because studies show if you're, if you're actually using positive reinforcement training, it is the animal's preferred form of enrichment. And it is. Um, a lot of times, but that, that just also depends when you're working with fearful or animals that aren't used to enriched environments, um, putting in a piece of quote unquote enrichment in, in animals environment that doesn't understand that isn't used to enrichment. That's sad, but you also see it cause, um, other undesirable behaviors. So these, a lot of times, um, pending, this is introducing enrichment. You need to place, pay close attention, observation, um, and a lot of times it needs to be shaped. So our volunteer, Cole Frisch, um, designed a piece of primate enrichment yesterday. So I thought this was pretty cool. So what he did is he took a spool. This is a spool that um, we get our poly rope on for enrichment. This is an empty spool. So Cole has taken prescription bottles, cleaned prescription bottles. Good morning, Carrie, Shelly, Susie, Sheila, Linda, uh, and Lisa, and another Lisa, and Alicia, and Kelly. Um, he has taken prescription bottles, filled them. So he came to me and was like, which pri oh, I said, we need to get more enrichment in with the primates. And primates are at the top of the list. So um, I'm responsible for 
all these animals enrichment. That's a lot, guys. Just being responsible for the enrichment of four animals is a lot. All right. At the Animal Behavior Center, we have five parrots, a toucan, two kookaburras, a turkey vulture, three dogs, and a pig. And we have eight volunteers. And that is not enough. All right. So I'm here to tell you enrichment is individualized, needs to be played as close attention to. It helps modify behavior. It's essential. It's not an option in my eyes. It is not an option. If you don't have time to appropriately enrich the animals in your care, you may want to second guess or find a way to make that happen. Um, uh, Quentin is on here. I haven't seen you in a long time, Quentin. Not sure if you remember the story of Peyton and how I couldn't touch him or get near him without him lunging. Now I'm able to get him out and hold him all thanks to your training. Thanks, Quentin. That makes what I do work well. Thank you. Um, so this enrichment. So Cole came to me asking me, um, what do we supply for the, what do we provide for the primates? And I said, well, okay, there's a lot of different primates here. Which primate, which species do you want to focus on? So he's like, he goes, I don't know. So I need to know which species you want to focus on because, and then I want to, what is that species capable of? And then I want to focus on the individual. What is that individual capable of? Because lemurs aren't necessarily as good with their hands as say a baboon. Um, so he said, well, this is what I have. You know, I want to do something with this. And he showed me this spool and he showed me these prescription bottles. And then he told me, this is what he's thinking about doing. So I'm sitting here going through all the primates. And I'm like, okay, this is obviously going to be a piece of enrichment that the individual has to be good with their hands. Um, and like baboons are very, the two here are very good with their teeth, ripping things open. So I thought, I want this, instead of ripping things open, I want this to go to an animal that's good with its hands. So I said, let's try the spider monkeys. So he's like, okay, well, what should I fill it with? So um, I know the spider monkeys love their fruit. So I said, how about some grapes and some bananas and some apples or pears or berries or something like that? So this is what he did. And so then I started taking photos and videos of the spider monkeys with us. Now, this is just one piece of enrichment. Enrichment brings choice, complexity, opportunities, eliminates behavior issues, all right? So the first time the spider monkey interacted with this, it scared him. And I got this all on video, and I was like, well, that's interesting. Um, this is why I always tell people, keep your animal used to change. Now. This, if it scared this monkey too bad, I would have taken it out immediately. But what I kept seeing was, and I have the video, and it's a cool video. He went up to it, he showed his teeth, and he hit it. He threw it, he threw it across the cage, and then he ran after it, and then he threw it again. So what he's doing is he's interacting with it and keeping a distance and trying to see what this piece, what this enrichment is going to, how it's going to respond. And how it responded was it just rolled, okay? Once he saw he could get it under his control, um, he was nervous. So I said, hey, Cole, go run and grab a banana. So this, obviously, this um, spool has a hole in the middle right here. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. Where um, it's the center of the spool where the poly rope was wrapped around. So he gave me a banana and I took off half of it and I shoved it down in that school. So why I did it is I wanted, he wasn't understanding that there's food in the um, uh, prescription bottles. So when you provide a piece of enrichment and it's too complex or the animal doesn't understand, it can positively punish their behavior of interacting with it. It can punish it, it can make it and the animal just stops. And then every time you try to put in new enrichment, the animal doesn't interact with it because 
we've taken too big of steps in our in our shaping process. Um, the animal doesn't understand. And um, if you're working with an animal in an unenriched environment, um, they already know that no matter what they do in their enclosures, they have no control over their outcome. That is an unempowered animal. And that is my primary goal in the work that I do and why I get up every morning is to make that change, literally. Um, so I said, grab me a banana and we shoved it in the center. So why I did that is I could tell we were taking two big steps in our shaping process um, and this spider monkey wasn't exactly sure of that there's treats inside. So what I did was make it really easy for him to see it, boom. I see a banana, I see it right there in the hole, and he immediately went over, he jumped down like this and started sticking his fingers in that hole and licking it. And the more he did that, the more he picked it up and looked at the other side, and there was more banana there. And the more he did that, then you saw him start to interact with it more. And he started picking it up, moving it around. And I have this on video. Um, and then he started interacting, he was like, you can see him sticking his head in there, trying to pull this apart. Um, maybe I share this video with you here when we're done. Not at 10 o'clock. Um, but it was really cool to see, and it kept the spider monkey engaged for a very long time. Now, the next time I put a piece of enrichment in there, I may want to stay around the same size, and I may want to do it fairly quickly like today, okay? Because the longer the time happens that I don't or the bigger step I take in, say I put a five gallon bucket in there, it could totally freak them out because it's two biggest steps in our shaping plants. Capiche? Um, so, hey Renee, good to see you. Beth Peoples, good to see you, Maggie, Eva. Um, Susan Duckworth, say hello. Yeah, Susan and her daughter, Robin. Hello. I saw Robin the other day. Um, so, hey, Deb, good to see you. Um, so, <laughs> is that Adrian says, I'm getting lots of enrichment watching the auto captioning feature. Try to guess what you're saying. <laughs> I've watched it. Don't watch it. It'll be a scary thing. Um, so that's what we did for the spider monkeys. And enrichment isn't even the topic, our topic today. Um, but this is what we're doing, um, incorporating schedule change here to free up the keepers to be able to know their species that they're working with. And when you know the species you're working with, means you understand the species you're working with and you can communicate better with that species through training and enrichment. Um, so we all also, yes, I just wiped my nose on my sleeve. COVID makes that happen. It makes it okay. <laughs> my mom's probably watching this going, oh my God, my daughter's doing this on the live stream. Um, so we also are in charge of cats, um, larger cats, exotic cats. So yesterday, zookeeper Amanda, who will be in here at any time, um, made this for a serval that's in our care. So we have been, myself, Amanda, and Cole, have been interacting with this two-year-old serval that's come in our care. Um, we're able to get in the enclosure with her. We, I can tell she wants touched. I can tell it. I can tell it by her behaviors. By um, And it's taking her, she's been here two weeks, it's taking her some time to calm down. This is a big change for her and it's been very stressful for her. And we're trying to take that stress, stress out through training and providing an enrichment. So we came up with a homemade little cat while we're waiting for our cat toys to be delivered. Um, Amanda took this tree branch, tied a string to it and sitting in here with a room with two black cast hornbills a demoiselle crane, two hyacinth macaws. Um, there's some other animals in here too, but 
we have a room full of feathers. What do cats like? As long as cats can never get to these birds. Um, she tied some feathers. There's some scent on there. And um, this is a cat toy. So this is Goldie. We can better understand Goldie through um, providing enrichment and watching how her behaviors change. Like when we first would walk into this room, um, we provided, I put boxes in her enclosure, a couple different boxes to give her places to hide. I gave her height to get her up in a way to be able to get away from people if it's people that are stressing her out. Okay. I don't want to force this cat. Can I? Well, I can force anything to do what I want it to do. And, but I know better. So I don't have to use force. All right. Um, and the reinforcer behind using force is the immediacy. You get the behavior now. You get the behavior now, but one of the side effects of using force to control behavior is having to increase that force. Another side effect of using force to control behavior is um, increased aggression. Okay? So I don't want to go in, and I have. I, I work a lot with animals that have are used to being controlled by force. Um, and I don't want to work that hard. Okay. But that's not the main reason I want to empower the animal. I want the animal to have choice and give me the behavior I want. Cause that is a lot stronger. That ends up being a lot stronger. It's my first, my index. Finger. That ends up being a lot stronger, a lot more predictable, uh, and a lot more humane than using force. And it is, ends up stronger in the long run. Okay. I don't want to have to put that stress on animals and I don't want to have to chase animals. I don't want to have, I don't want to work that hard. Okay. The more I force an animal to do something, the more likely science shows that force comes back or the more I reinforce the animal running away from me. Um, you're not going to force these guys to do much of anything, especially when they're out. Okay. And they can fly. Yes. Um, so, okay, I can understand this animal better through providing enrichment in addition to the enrichment of my training. So right here, the serval is standing on her back legs and she's pawing at this, okay? Why is that a big deal? Why is that a big deal? Because this is not a behavior. We just recently started seeing this behavior. Uh, the behaviors we've been seeing is ears flattened back, nose really pointed, and hissing. Guess what? That doesn't seem like an animal that's very excited to see us. Okay, so I've understand I've understood that this means I'm not comfortable. Stay away. But what I'm seeing is complete different behavior here. I'm seeing this cat has some seriously long legs. I'm seeing her ears, how big her ears are, and what what does excitement look like? What does excitement mean? Okay. She's pawing at this. Her eyes are focused on this. I'm looking at ears, so I'm starting to understand what alert, interested looks like. All right. And then now I have an additional reinforcer. So we have used chicken strips with her as a reinforcer to reinforce behavior of coming close to the front of the cage. We've used eggs, raw eggs. Um, I have been able to incorporate a little bit of, I've barely been able to touch her and I can force myself to touch her, but I know the consequences of what that's going to have in the future. All right. Um, I want to get this animal doing all kinds of things. I need it to get on a scale. I need it to let me take her temperature, check her ears, check her eyes, check her mouth for vet exams. It takes the stress out of the vet exam. We had a vet here three weeks ago that she said she planned an hour and a half for a veterinary exam for our two Siberian lynx because she was ready to do whatever she had to do if she had to dart them or whatever. And I was like, well, you don't do any of that. They're trained. They're trained to do this. And I was able to get a weight to her and I was able to target train them 
to for her to be able to get a swab at her ears and done in 10 minutes. And she said she had planned an hour and a half for this exam and we were done in 10 minutes. Okay. No force, no stress. And the animals had all the choice in the matter. Okay. Um, so that is what providing enrichment for to empower animals is why I got into this field. Okay. I am a professional animal trainer and animal behavior consultant. I don't even necessarily need to know the species of animal. All I need to know is the behavior. And I'll start digging and asking questions because that is how I was trained in applied behavior analysis to start gathering clues, cues, not, not clues, cues. When does the behavior happen? When doesn't the behavior happen? What happens when you do this? What happens when you don't do this? Um, and a lot of times you begin before the undesired behavior starts. Hence our live stream. Was that last week or two weeks ago? I think last week was with Lena Kelly on alligators. So the reason, the reason I do what I do is because I've loved animals since I was a kid, since I can even remember. I remember taking a test in the eighth grade asking trying to determine my career well that oh i forgot to show a photo um totally ended up not being the path i took i thought i wanted to be a um, veterinarian because a lot of people think why do you think that's happening i'm gonna take take a guess you wouldn't know because you can't hear it there's a turkey outside right there Bernard. They're staring at Bernard. Anyways, um, I love empowering animals. Okay. And when I first got into this field, huh, it was through the word world of birds. Kinda. Um, I knew I always wanted to the opportunity to work in the field of animals with animals, but I didn't know what my options were, and I thought they were in order to control that behavior. I've got to control that turkey. Um, so I thought the only way. I, the only options I had in working with animals was to be a veterinarian. Well, um, I thought. I thought the only way I could be in this field was to be a veterinarian, okay? Um, and I remember being in the seventh grade when I used to live in Litchfield, Michigan, and I walked to the veterinarian's office, and I was this little kid, and the vet tech, well, I think they were so not busy that the vet tech wasn't even there, it was just the veterinarian, and he asked, what can I help you with? You got a puppy you want me to see? And I was like, no, sir. Doctor, um, I think I want to be a veterinarian. He goes, why? And I said, because I love working with animals. And he gave me a book to read. I can't remember his name. I can't remember the book. But I never forgot that experience and how willing he was to help me. A young little girl coming into his office in this tiny little town in Michigan wanting to be a veterinarian. Well, as I grew up, I kept taking classes to enter the field of biology. I wanted to be a marine biologist. And then I found out, no, I don't want to be a marine biologist. No, I don't want to be a veterinarian because I, I want to work ongoing relationships with animals. I don't want to have to put animals down, which 
I've recently been involved in things like that. But I do that because I love that animal. If that's the right choice for that animal and it's suffering somehow. Um, and if I have that relationship with that animal, I have to, I want to be the last thing that they see and soothe them on their way into whatever's next for them. Um, but I knew I did not, I thought about veterinarian. I was like, okay, I'm going to be taking care of sick animals. I'm not going to necessarily know these animals or yes, I do know you because you're here for your flea medication. Um, or you're here for your annual, annual checkup. I haven't seen you in a year. I wanted more contact, more of a relationship with animals. So, um, I knew a veterinarian wasn't for me and wasn't going to school that long. So then what did I think I wanted to do? <clears throat> Marine biologist. And I was like, yeah, I'm fascinated with underwater life. I always have been. I'm fascinated with dinosaurs, underwater life. Those have been two of my big loves in life. Um, only until about 15 years ago do I, did I fall in love with birds, um, dinosaurs. So you need, to, if you're thinking about getting into this field, and I get a lot of people asking me, like we're getting ready to take on a student from Ohio State um, that works at a local zoo that wants to volunteer for us. Um, and we get a lot of people that come in that aren't sure if they want to be a veterinarian or somebody that specializes in behavior and behavior. Oh, be still my heart. Both of my hornbills are at the front of their cage. Wilma and Fred. Um, so a lot of people don't know. So where's your passion? You need to ask yourself why. What do you want to go into and why? And a lot of times, well, your whys are going to be the reinforcer behind why you want to get in to what you get into. Okay. There's a ton of different fields in working with animals. Um, figure out what your passions are. And you can do a lot of this and you can save yourself a lot of time by starting to volunteer. Okay. Volunteer. Ah. I volunteered at um, dog and cat shelters, fostering. I answered the phone. Okay. Then I found out, wow, there is there's a real problem in this world with cats, stray cats, feral cats, people not wanting cats anymore, cats peeing in the house. And I was just like, whoa, no to self, don't get a cat. Um, so... Um, Daniela asked me, have you considered being a vet behaviorist? No, I have a lot of vet behaviorists that get in touch with me and just recently had some, I think somewhere down in Florida, asked me to, to share my articles with their clients. Um, I do have vet behaviorists reach out to me. Daniela, I'm right where I want to be. I am right where I want to be. The only other place I'd want to be besides right here, okay, is retired. And that'll come up within the next 15 years. And even when I retire, <laughs> there's no retirement in this for me. Like, you really think I'm going to stop doing what I'm doing. I, I work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. So keep that in mind when you start working in your passion. Literally, I have for years. Okay. I purchased, I started my own business nine years ago. I've never worked so hard in my life. I have never worked so hard in my life. Okay. And it is stress, different levels of stress, a lot of worry. You wake up at three o'clock in the morning. Okay. Worried. You can't sleep. I did it since this morning because I was also sleeping next to a sick animal that I'm taking care of, but because I want to. Okay. Um, 
I get a lot of gray hairs. I wouldn't say a lot of wrinkles. They're coming. I'm getting ready to turn 50. Um, due to experience, stress, different levels of stress. Um, hey, Lynn, good to see you on here. Um, you're taking care of animals. There's... That's Wilma. That's Wilma. Um, I try to imitate her, but I feel like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, big changes for Wilma and Fred happening in about 20 minutes. Um, when you get into the field of working with animals and you love what you do, be ready to work your ass off. Okay. Um, sometimes it's three to four hours of sleep, nonstop work on the computer. Make sure if you want to own your own business that you like to do paperwork <laughs> while you're hiring people to do training because you're too busy trying to run your own business. That's when you get too big too fast, okay? Or bite off more than you can chew. So I don't want to say start slow, but I want to, I want to say begin focused. Many people jump into this like I did, um, but I had a big building I needed to pay for. So you're training all kinds of things. And that's okay because my specialty is not necessarily training a particular species of animal. My specialty is using the science of behavior in its application with animals. Animals. Preferably non-human animals. But unfortunately, when you get into this business, you're working with animals too, because you got to get through the people to get to the animals, to properly care for the animals. You do that. That is why I got out of dog training. Okay. Because to me, I, I can train a lot of dogs. I can train a lot of dogs, but that's not where my heart is. My heart is in working with exotics. Because exotics often, that's right, Wilma. Exotics often have less choice than working with domestics, okay? They're in enclosures. Um, and my goal is, I have constantly have to have something to do. My goal is to empower them through choice, control, and complexities. And that is called training, behavior modification, and enrichment. And those are the three things I do. And I'm very passionate about it. And if somebody has a problem with that, I just say, please step aside and let me do my work. Um, I'm very passionate about the work I do. I'm very intense in the work that I do. I like to laugh and have fun with people, but when my jobs are finished or throughout them, um, there's a lot of, I'm very focused in my work and um, I don't laugh or talk a lot while I'm working, but when I'm done, I do. I'm a person that likes to have, I want a hell of a lot of fun um, and training is a lot of fun for me. So. Um, <laughs> I love to empower animals. So volunteer. If you volunteer, I've got one more photo I need to show you of some enrichment I provided yesterday, which is nothing short of fabulous. Volunteer. There's different places you can volunteer. Let's see. I had some written down. Um, anybody on here? Cause I know you can volunteer in dog shelters, cat shelters, parrot shelters. You can volunteer at sanctuaries. You can volunteer at exotic animal and sanctuaries, retired exotic animal sanctuaries. Um, where else can you volunteer? Um, you can probably volunteer a lot of different places. Um, you can volunteer at zoos. You can volunteer in Sylvia, Kozerchuk. You can volunteer at farm animals, farm sanctuaries, 
Um, you can also, you can do a lot of things. <clears throat> um, get in there and volunteer. When you start volunteering, you start seeing, holy crap, this is a lot of work. Okay, you may be starting volunteering where you are just cleaning up dog crap, cleaning up pig crap, cleaning up bison crap, okay? But you know what you're doing? You're seeing all that it takes to take care of this animal. And you may be sitting there cleaning up cat poop and cleaning kennels all day. But you're, what you're seeing is, hey, you know what? I really, what is that bird doing over there? And maybe I'm a little more interested in birds. Or maybe you're sitting here taking care of a screaming parrot and changing papers. And you're like, you know, this dog has been barking excessively in this back room for the past 45 minutes. Behavior happens for a reason. There is not one behavior that happens for no reason. Behavior always serves a purpose. Okay. And when we say it happens for no reason, it's because we don't know better. And a lot of times it's due to stress. I just had a podcast that we just published in our membership uh, this past weekend, which is called, is it overstimulation or is it anxiety? Like dogs excessively barking, jumping. So you may be sitting here working with birds in a shelter and you hear a dog in the back room and you're like, this like if I hear that, that constant, yep, 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 and it keeps going on, I, if I could apply behavior analysis, observable, measurable behavior, this is measurable. I can feel my heart rate going dunk, 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 dunk. So that brings on anxiety for me. When I see or hear or smell or feel an animal in a stressful situation, I start getting worked up. I can't focus on conversations in front of me because I'm just paying attention to is this behavior in the background maintaining or increasing? If it's yes, that is reinforced. If no, <laughs> okay, why? Um, so volunteer. Um, oh, Leslie, that's awesome. She says, the best time I've ever had when I was elbow deep into peer manure. Um, yeah, when you're knee deep, hopefully you're never knee deep in dog manure. Um, cause you got a serious overcapacity problem, but when you're knee deep in, um, crap, your understanding, I see you. Don't you look at me like that. You're understanding behavior. Okay. Buying myself some time here. Um, Sylvia says, you can, even at vet clinics, you learn how to observe. I had observe, I, I observed, I volunteered at a vet clinic for a long time mm -hmm. in avian and exotic vet clinic. And I loved it. Loved it. Um, and I loved, I worked the front desk. I also eventually started doing behavior consultations. Um, so those are different areas you can volunteer. You can get your certifications in many different areas. You can get, do your research on your certifications, okay? Do your research because I know a lot of people out there that get them and um, second guess why they got it. So ask around, all right? Continue your education. I took master, I went back to school and took master level classes in applied behavior analysis, not on particular. I mean, it was all studying, it was all human behaviors, human issues, um, severe human issues, such as self injurious behaviors, um, hoarding, which is usually a mental concern. Um, and I was working with people mm -hmm. and I didn't mind because I wanted to work with animals. I didn't mind working with the people in the cases. You can come on. Huh? I am doing coffee with the critters. Julie Kessinger, you wanna be on coffee with the critters? <laughs> oh, come on, nobody cares. I've just got this in my background. Julie Kessinger, get your butt in here. <laughs> um, so, um, 
Somebody want to remind me where I was. That's how my mind works. That's why I work so well with animals. Um, so, okay. Um, certifications. All right. And get your education. Oh, back to working with ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, with people. I didn't mind. You know why I didn't mind? Is because I was fascinated with applied behavior analysis. I don't analysis. I don't care what species I'm working with. I even worked in um, managed control settings with people with mental concerns. Okay, that was fascinating because I was putting my ABA to work, and that is when I start. When I, not when I started. I saw the laws of behavior coming, happening right in front of my face. You can be as book smart as you want. Application is 65% at least, and that's my saying only. If you are book smart and you are not putting your hands on experience interacting with this, you are not learning near as much as you could. I've seen book smart people come in here and they start interacting with my animals. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> it's because they don't have the application. All right. Um, Nancy, hey, um, says, I worked with people for 30 years with behavior issues. When I went into animal care and behavior, I was shocked uh, at how much of the programs were the same. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times I see in the world of animal care, I see more humane ethics being applied to animals than I do to people. And I've had somebody that's a board certified analyst tell me that is correct. Um, I see this group of people when I was having an event at the Animal Behavior Center, he goes, you guys are treating the animals in your care with the utmost. Uh, Utmost, eth utmost ethics and humanity than what we're doing with the kids in our school system. Holy shit, was that an eye opener? Okay. I was like, you're kidding me. And he's like, no. He goes, this is exciting to see how passionate this group of people, this field of work is, but it makes me realize holy crap, we can be doing so much better. So it's not about the species for me. It's about the behavior, behavior change. Um, so Sylvia says, I even did volunteer toy making with community living and practice. Good. Um, my passion is applied behavior analysis and using it with animals. Okay. And I choose exotics. You know why? Because I have colleagues that are fabulous with working with domestic animals, such as dogs and cats. I send a lot of my cat behavior consultations to Jennifer Mauger down there in Cleveland. Um, I send a lot of people with doing online dog consultations with even to Sylvia here. Um, Sylvia is up in Sylvia. I know you're in Canada. Is it Ontario? Please correct me if I'm wrong. But it doesn't matter, all right? During the times of COVID, we have, here at the Animal Behavior Center, we've been live streaming our work for six years. COVID has forced a lot of the animal community to go virtual right now, like six months ago, okay? Um, I chose to live stream my work versus going into people's houses because a lot of times when I go into people's houses, your animal isn't going to act the same. I'm not going to see the same behavior. You know why? Because two things are going to happen. I'm an environmental event that has just walked in that's going to change behavior. Your animal does this undesirable behavior when he's very comfortable, when something new isn't there. Um, the other thing is, is I'm so in tune with behavior that I will not pay attention to my conversation with you because I'm watching behavior and I've already started identifying reinforcers within the first 30 seconds of talking to you. And I'll kind of look at the person and say, I'm sorry, I didn't hear words you said. I didn't hear words you said. I was too busy training your animal and identifying reinforcers and punishers and understanding already why behavior is happening. So I don't necessarily need to know 
the species of animal. All you have to do is tell me the behavior and I'll start asking questions, identifying reinforcers. Um, and I've done it with many different species. So your species of animals, you can, if you're also looking for education, check out our memberships. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of uh, metro parks, zoos, shelters. We have board certified behavior analysts in our memberships, one and two both, and in our projects. Um, and you're going to see level two. Wait till you see who's getting ready to come on. Um, you can figure out what species you want to work with. You can work with dogs. You can work at, with shelters. You can work with you can work with um, exotics. People who have exotics in their home. You can work with farm animals, zoos, sanctuaries. And if you want to get more specific, get more specific. Okay, you can work with pigs. Get more specific because you'll become extremely popular and well known when you're very good at what you do and you pick an area of specialty, such as separation, anxiety, and working with dogs, okay? When, if you work with just dogs, but you get even more specific, like working with separation, anxiety, and dogs, then you'll be known for the person to contact that works with separation, anxiety, and dogs, okay? Work with separation, anxiety, and parrots, which is, most people don't understand what that looks like. Um, okay, you can work. Oh, you could get in the field of working with separ or, um, deaf dogs. You can get into the field of working with deaf and blind dogs. You can get into the field of working with blind birds. Well, you'd probably be very well known um, with people who are working with blind birds. Um, say that you might want to work with, instead of, you could do special needs, work with special needs animals, work with special needs birds, work with special needs pigs, special needs exotics. Be specific. Um, hey, Sylvia. Sylvia says the animal behavior ship memberships have brought my continuing education to another level. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Okay. So you can work with exotics. I choose to work with undomesticated and exotics, primarily exotics. I obviously like I'm training alligators. I'm training yesterday as training baboons. Um, working with exotics for me is I love change. Different. I love to say, what the hell is that? What am I, what behavior, what the hell does that behavior mean? A challenge is reinforcing for me. Uh, I was just having a conversation the other day with the most awesome Joel, BCBA, Joel Vitovic. And I told him, I said, intimidation is a reinforcer for me. If I'm intimidated, it means I'm like intimidated to me means like, whoa, I don't know if I can approach that person or whoa, I don't understand what that behavior means from that animal. It makes me a little nervous. When I'm nervous, it's because I don't understand what I'm seeing. And if I don't understand something, that is the reinforcer behind me to begin understanding it. And I start, that is my challenge accepted. That is why I start getting in. When, what does the servo look like when it's batting at things? Uh, what, what does the servo look like when it's batting at things? Um, why is that alligator running to me so fast? Um, <laughs> what's going to happen next? And I find all of that out through training. And that is my reinforcer. I also like to work with exotics because the variety is there. No one day is ever the same. No one encounter with that animal is ever the same. That's with every animal. But I work with a lot of animals where I have to work off contact. I can't even touch this animal. Um, because it can easily rip a limb off. All right. Um, it, but a lot of times that off contact moves to protected contact where I can touch the animal. Um, like with the lynx, I call them up to a wall 
and I get them to target so I can touch their butt. And But there's cage bars here, but I'm touching their butt, preparing them for an injection, all right? So I don't have to force that animal to do anything. That's how I trained the giraffe to allow me to, well, I didn't do it, but prepare for a jugular blood draw. Um, I prefer to work with exotics because because they, they're my best educators, okay? Because a lot of these exotics, can you force them to do something? Sure can. Better hope those cage bars never come down between you because they'll kill you. They'll kill you. So I have found situations where I had never planned for cage bars to be down between us. But guess what? Oh, crap. Here we are. They're down. What do I do? Thank God that animal looks at me as a... Um, as a way to empower them versus somebody that controls behavior through force, negative reinforcement, which is coercion and aversives, something the animal doesn't like. Okay. If I have it, heck is going on out there. I have an animal or a person that interacts with me like that. I, don't, I just stay away from them. Um, my life's too short. So, some of the downfalls are some of the things you'll see when you get in this field. 24-7 work. Make sure you want to work. Okay. Um, burnout. I see a lot of people with burnout. I've been doing this for a long time. I think if I was going to get burnout, I would have burned out by now. My family would told me when I started this business nine years ago, they're like, Laura, be careful. You're going to burn out. You're working 24-7. You never take a break. Still here. Digging in deeper. Um, caregiver's fatigue. I've had that. I've seen it. Okay. It's tough. Caregiver's fatigue. Where your life... Your life is controlled by caring for others. And you don't take care of yourself. you got to find the balance. you got to find the balance. So... Um, Blah. This is the photo I forgot to show. Um, Denali, the Demazel Crane here. Been training him for two months. Um, and yesterday he was able to get outside for the first time um, since he's been here. And we did that through. We had to harness train him, um, train him for a leash. Um, it didn't go 100% as smoothly as I wanted. Because along came a turkey, and we were like, the turkey's like, hey, there's a crane. Let's go see the crane. And the crane was like, hey, there's a turkey. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> and we went. Um, so if you have questions, concerns, what have you, um, please feel free to reach out to me, okay? I love helping people who love what they do. And that's what I do in my memberships and I have projects. I will give 110% to somebody that shows that they're struggling or they love what they do and they really want to do this. And yes, Eva, you are correct. And I often tell people, when you own your own business, every day is a Monday. That's the truth. When you love what you do, every day is a Friday. That is the truth as well. So if you like what you have seen in this live stream, um, this is what we do in our level one and level two memberships. If you have questions about our level one or level two membership, please feel free to email me, Laura, at the animal behavior center .com. Level one is primarily for people with companion animals. And we have podcasts, monthly Q&As, live streams. Level two is for people who want higher education in the field of applied animal behavior, the science of behavior, thinking about getting into the field of applied animal behavior. Um, we have zookeepers, I'm coming, zookeepers, BCBAs, um, shelters, people who are just want to know more um, in level two. And we also... Our podcasts are huge. Those are in level one and level two, and people will say the podcasts alone are worth joining. You get monthly podcasts. Um, they're also, we have species-specific projects 
which will, you will find on our website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. On our website, you will also find our webinars, um, which are recorded. And this winter, we will be live streaming new webinars again in topics, in different topics, different species, okay? We also have our animal referral program where for every five people you refer to the Animal Behavior Center that joins, um, you get one free online consultation with more. Okay, you guys, I got to run. I got a lot of stuff to do today. All right, take care. And thank you everybody for joining. I will see you next week where, Bernard, um, I believe we have a guest on next week. Pay attention to um, the, our Facebook page.